Welcome back. Today, we get to go through marine life. We're going to start off with the classification of life. We're going to move to marine biology, including marine ecology. Air jaws. Discovery Channel and Shark Week have made this area in South Africa famous. Uh, the white sharks actually breach as they attack seals. This has brought a thriving tourist industry for people who want to ride a boat and see a white shark jump, take pictures. Uh, they drag behind silhouettes of seals cut out of carpet and the white sharks attack from below and they thrust themselves into the air as they make the hit. Me, personally, I've gone on a couple of shark rodeos myself uh, as a younger scuba diver, uh, photography buff, photographing sharks feeding and swimming around. I had a unique experience uh, in Walker's Key, Bahamas uh, with spinning black tip sharks, spinners, and they as I was in the water, were jumping out and around me and spinning in midair and then landing. So that was quite thrilling. Scary, yes. Thrilling, indeed. So uh, we're going to talk about the classification of marine life. Uh, a little housekeeping. The zones in the ocean where life is found. Uh, littoral zone, littoral zone is the intertidal area okay uh, light reaches the bottom you have influences of the tides uh, that's called the littoral zone the neuritic zone you can see along the top neuritic zone is the area over the continental shelf so it's relatively shallow and a uh, very productive area because sunlight is available for photosynthesis throughout most of it. Now in the littoral zone, sunlight's available throughout it all. If you recall the euphotic or what we call photic zone, the euphotic in this particular Thompson's text, this is from the internet, uh, the photic zone includes euphotic and dysphotic. I've also uh, seen where it's called photic and dysphotic. So it just depends on the source that you're at, but just so you understand, euphotic means there's enough light for photosynthesis. Dysphotic means there's enough light for vision only. And then aphotic means no light. So the oceanic zone is the area over the abyss, over the trench. Uh, so basically it's over the deep ocean. So you have littoral, neuritic, oceanic. Another term for oceanic zone, and you can see it there, pelagic. Pelagic means in the water column over that deep. So you have the shelf. The bathial zone refers to the slope. The abyss means ocean floor. And hadal means deep sea trenches. So that's just a little terminology as we move through uh, this unit of marine biology. So the littoral zone is the coast, the ocean or the sea, between the high and low tides. Uh, you can see in the uh, image there, the splash zone does not get inundated with water, but it does have oceanic influence. Uh, the littoral intertidal has high and low tides, so you have periods of inundation and uh, exposure. Infralittoral is lower, and then circulatoral is just below that uh, lowest of the low tides, but you still have uh, some periods where there's possible exposure. As you move down these zones, you get bands of life. So that's zones of life. Uh, the littoral zone, you have to be able to take uh, a lot of exposure 
in the circulatory zone, you wouldn't need to be able to handle exposure that often. So basically where you are in this zone uh, depends on your adaptability. Neuritic zone, neuritic zone is over the shelves. Ample sunlight, about 200 meters deep is the depth of this neuritic zone. We also refer to it as the shelf zone because it's over the continental shelf. And this combined with littoral has over 90% of the ocean's life in it. Most life is solar-based. The oceanic or pelagic uh, are over the, the, the deep. Pelagic fish are fish that can be found migrating over this area. Uh, you have to have the ability to uh, travel in limited productivity areas to be a pelagic fish. Uh, we generally refer to that as blue water. Uh, the images there, uh, you have a whale shark, uh, which is the largest cartilaginous fish. Uh, in, in cartilaginous fish are fish that lack calcified bones. Below that, you have the ocean sunfish or mola mola, and that is the largest bony fish as far as mass go. So the whale shark's a filter feeder. It swims around eating plankton, small fish, whatever it can gulp through. So it strains the water. Uh, the mola mola eats jellyfish. The bathial zone, the bathial zone is found over the continental slope. The abyss, now the abyssal zone is found over the ocean floor, so it's very deep. The hadal zone is found in the deepest of trenches. Looking at marine organisms, we can classify them with, in three general categories, the plankton, the benthin, and the nectin. Planktos, benthos, nectos. Uh, these are Greek terms. Planktos refers to wanderers, drifters. They ride on these ocean currents. Phytoplankton are photosynthetic plankton. Zooplankton are heterotrophic, eating other organisms plankton. You don't necessarily have to be an animal to be a zooplankton. You can be a protozoa as well. The phytoplankton account for approximately 90% of the ocean's primary productivity. Primary productivity is the base of the food chain photosynthetic uh, activity. So diatoms, dinoflagellate, coccolithophores are all small phytoplankton. Zooplankton, heterotrophs, you can be a holoplankton, your entire life is spent in the plankton or a meroplankton part of your life cycle usually juvenile you are plankton then you grow into something else most organisms pass through a planktonic stage much like on land how wind disperses pollen and seeds in the ocean currents disperse juvenile organisms tides and currents so uh, that's what organisms use to propagate the species, these water movements. Some protists belonging to kingdom protista, and we're gonna take a look at some of the uh, kingdoms, the, the six kingdoms of life. This image, you have calcareous ooze. If you remember back to sediments, calcium-based ooze, calcareous ooze. These uh, are foraminifera here. Uh, zooplankton can also be animals like jellyfish and comb jellies. Comb jellies belong to a group of animals called tenophora. 
You can also have multi-celled, a little more developed uh, animals like the copepods, which are the most abundant plankton uh, in the ocean, in Tampa Bay region for sure, and krill, which fuel these Antarctic food chains. Uh, the largest animal in the world, the blue whale, lives off of the krill. Then, of course, you have the larva, which are the meroplankton. Uh, early crustaceans are called nopolis, early fish fry, and you can even see bivalves. Uh, they have planktonic larvae used to disperse as well. Benthic, benthos, means bottom dwelling. So these are the organisms that live attached or buried in the sea floor. Epifauna and infauna. Nectin means swimming. Organisms that can move against the current under their own propulsion. They don't always actively, a lot of times they utilize the current. Sometimes, like dermosol fish, live on the bottom like the flounder, and they can swim, but then they spend time in kind of a benthic lifestyle as well. So, nectin refers to organisms that can self-propel and don't necessarily rely on the currents for their motility. Carolus lineus, pretty much put together the way we classify organisms today. Aristotle was the first taxonomist and he used an animal, vegetable, mineral, classification so it wasn't really biological. Linnaeus classified and uh, charted many organisms. Modern taxonomy uses the did King Philip come over for green spaghetti domain, kingdom, phylum or division in plants, class, order, family, genus, species. And then scientific nomenclature is binomial, two names, the genus and the species. Homo sapiens, genus Homo, species sapiens, human beings. Terciops truncatus, terciops genus truncatus, species, bottlenose dolphin. So the genus and the species, that's the scientific name for organisms taken from its taxonomic categories. We're only going to cover two domains in this class. I've seen three, some texts have three. They split the uh, prokaryota into archaea and you bacteria, but I'm putting them in one for simplicity, prokaryotic cell type, no membrane bound organelles, no membrane bound nucleus, the simplest cell structure possible. The eukaryotes, eukaryota, have nuclear membranes and membrane systems in the cell structure. The kingdoms we're going to look at, archaeobacteria and eubacteria are the two prokaryota kingdoms. Kingdom Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Amelia are the eukaryotic kingdoms. So remember, two cell types, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. Uh, prokaryotes are the simple, solitary, sometimes living colonial lifestyle. Eukaryotes you know, can be single-celled and protista, but generally form the multi-celled, more complex. Prokaryotic cells are bacterial. Cyanobacteria, those blue-green bacteria or blue-green algae that I used to call them, also fall into the prokaryotic cell structure. Eukaryotic cell structure are larger, and have cell differentiation. They have organelles, tiny little membrane bound organs, organ like structures. Now, 
according to modern cell theory, prokaryotes living in aggregate begat eukaryotic cells in what we call endo inside endosymbiosis living together endosymbiotic relationships we see them on a large scale in coral reefs corals have uh, algae living in their tissues and they cannot live without each other they're truly one organism although they have an algae component and an animal component and that's a form of endosymbiotic living so the six kingdoms summarized are listed right here and the two groups the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes so take some time to learn this particular slide and familiarize yourself with it it'll come in handy now marine bacteria they're very abundant now viruses are not considered living things and they're the most abundant uh i don't know living non-living dna rna uh based or things so bacteria bacteria are the simplest things called life and the reason that viruses are not considered living is uh currently biologists use the cell theory, you have to be made of cells to be alive. And bacteria are the simplest cells. Viruses don't contain all the components for the cells. Also, vir viruses don't um, display all of the life activities that uh, are qualifications to be considered alive. So we have bacteria, archaea, the ancient eubacteria, uh, archaea bacteria like this purple sulfur bacteria uh, they can live in anoxic conditions they're called extremophiles they love extreme conditions temperatures or no oxygen uh, salinity extreme uh, this intertidal uh, purple sulfur bacteria smells horrible uh, because it's metabolizing chemicals chemosynthesis it's not using the sun uh, it has, its respiration is anaerobic, no oxygen needed. So they're, they, you know, the, the Archaeans are, are simple, extreme organisms. The U bacteria pictured here, some crusty, uh, old, uh, black looking blue green bacteria growing on a rock. Protista is the simplest eukaryotic cell structure generally they live alone or in colonies uh, even a kelp kelp is considered a algae which is considered a plant like protist and they start to show some cell specialization but their life the each cell's life activity is independent and can survive independent of the group so we consider them colonial, not multi-celled organisms. Plant-like, animal-like, which are protozoa, and then fungi-like, the slime molds. Plant-like protists, uh, algae, the seaweeds, primary producers, uh, phytoplankton, primary producers. So they're the most important primary producers in the ocean. Uh, here's diatoms. Diatoms are the most abundant aquatic organisms after viruses, which I mentioned. Are they living? Are they not? As a independent thinker, I would consider viruses alive. But as a person who knows that most references and texts say viruses are non-living, uh, I leave uh, that out there as well so you're not misinformed uh, but viruses bacteria are very abundant diatoms are very abundant they make up silicious ooze if you remember back to our sediments uh, the silica based life forms uh, dinoflagellates which can be bioluminescent they can make the ocean glow they uh, make a toxin 
neurotoxins to protect themselves. We call that red tide when they're in bloom. Uh, there's red tide pictured, dinoflagellate blooms. Uh, in Florida, Carina brevis, Carina being the genus, brevis being the species, that is Florida red tide. Other places in the world have different red tides. Red tide, if you eat something during a red time, you could get paralytic shellfish poisoning. It can make you quite ill. Toxins from the red tide. Macroscopic or algae that is large, uh, chlorophyta is the green algae, phaophyta, brown algae, rhodophyta, red algae. Uh, they all contain chlorophyll, which is green, but phaophyta contains other secondary pigments, which make it very brown. And rhodophyta also contains secondary pigments that makes it very red. Uh, some of the common sea lettuce, ulva. Here's a green algae sea lettuce. I see this washed up the shore all the time. Uh, Phaophyta, they're the largest of the protists. Here in the Gulf, sargassum is the most important. Uh, kelp in the North Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, and uh, racks. Uh, here's Gulf wheat sargassum. We often see this washed up. It forms huge mats that pelagic fish utilize in the Sargasso Sea. Here's kelp, very biologically productive cold water brown alga. Rhodophyta are very complex protists. They're found in the deepest water because red is attenuated. They don't utilize red light. That's why it looks red because they actually reflect the red light. So they're adapted for a little deeper living than the other two algae groups. Uh, poly uh, siphona on the bottom and chondrus. Chondrus is cool. That is harvested for ice cream. Uh, porphyra is also called nori in Asia, and that's used in sushi. It darkens up when it dries off, and that's what the wraps are made from. And corallina impregnates its cell structures with calcium carbonate. So it's almost like a little piece of coral, but it's an algae. Algae is very important. Agar comes from it for microbiology, laxatives, fillers for foods, uh, gels come from it for hair gel, toothpaste and pool filters are uh, using algae uh, for the, uh, the, like the diatoms, the uh, silica helps scrape the plaque off of your teeth or uh, filters the food, insecticides, the, uh, they, they kill, the, the insects actually breathe through sphericals, little holes in the uh, silica skeletons of diatoms, cut them up and kill them. So, so insecticides, they're used a lot. Uh, farmers use them, they spread them in chicken coops to keep the uh, insects from breeding in the, in the chickens. Uh, we eat algae and sushi, and they're important in coral reefs, uh, base of the food chain. Animal-like protists, we call protozoa, primitive animals. They're one-celled, eukaryotic, and they, uh, they, they show the characteristics of animals like they can move or, and or eat. Foraminifera are one of the most important. They have the little calcium tests, uh, and that is a foraminifera. Radiolaria have silica projections or spines radiating from their bodies. Now, kingdom plant, plantae, uh, they are not as common in the marine environment. As a matter of fact, seagrasses are completely underwater. Uh, they're not true grasses. Their, their stem actually grows in the sediment, helping it to uh, stay stable. 
so seagrasses, and then you have mangroves and salt marsh grasses. Those are the main plants. So you have emergent vegetation coming out of the water, mangroves, cord grass. You have submergent vegetation living completely underwater, seagrasses. And those are really the only three major groups of marine plant. Now, there's a lot of organisms that live on barrier islands, that live in the dunes, that are influenced by the marine environment. But these are this, the true marine plants right here. That's it. The images, salt marsh, mangrove, seagrass. Now, kingdom Animalia, eukaryotic, multi-celled, have muscles, and they eat. So animals, Animalia. This chart will come in handy. Take a few minutes to look at it. Hit pause and copy down the terms. Periphera, Cnidaria. Missing from there is Tenophora, C-T-E-N-O-P-H-O-R-A. Those are comb jellies. Then you have the worms. Uh, annelids are the important worms. Platyhelminthes and nematodes. Eh. Mollusks, arthropods, echinoderms, and chordates. So, you know, take a few minutes and look at these phyla, large-scale groups of organisms, and the examples of them. Periphera are the sponges. They're filter feeders. They release their gametes, sperm and egg, into the marine environment, the water. The tides mix these sperm and eggs, generally on a spring tide, because you get the most water movement. So most organisms reproduce on spring tides, full moons, new moons, lunar cycle reproduction. Uh, and then the new plankton, only for a while until they develop, get moved by these tides, settle down, and grow into adult sponges. Cnidaria, the sea anemone, that's a polyp, tentacles up. The jellyfish, that's a medusa, tentacle down. And then the Portuguese man o' war, which is really a colonial, many different organisms living together as a greater organism. Uh, they're called zooids, uh, different animals living together in symbiosis as a larger animal. Tenophora, we mentioned that, the comb jellies, they don't have the stingers that the cnidarians have. Uh, they also can bioluminesce to attract plankton, which they eat. Platyhelminthes, not huge in the marine environment, very common in freshwater systems, and a lot of them are uh, parasitic, like tapeworms. Nematodes are roundworms. These guys, got a story about nematodes. Uh, Spanish colonists, they... When, when Spain would colonize an area, it would bring a lot of its plants and animals and let them go wild, let them go feral, like pigs, horses, uh, citrus. A lot of things were brought and, and put around the world by, by settlers, so they would be more familiar when people came over and moved and colonized. Now, Florida soil is full of these nematodes, and these nematodes love sweet citrus. So all the citrus that was dispersed, all the sweet citrus died. Only the bitter, sour citrus lived. The nematodes didn't fancy them. So what, now, now we are the citrus state. We have a citrus bowl football game for crying out loud. Uh, but all of our citrus is cloned and grafted on a bitter citrus rootstock to protect against these nematodes. Because these nematodes, they will destroy your crops if it's sweet root. So that's just a little nematode story, roundworms. We have parasitic roundworms and things, but when we're studying the marine environment, we don't see too many free-living roundworms.
and the lids we see plenty of sandworms and dust feather duster worms some filter feed some burrow you even see the picture of the the freshwater leech below that's a worm that um, medieval doctors used to pull the blood out of people because uh, they do pierce the flesh and suck the blood uh, they would believe that they were getting rid of bad blood uh, but those are segmented worms mollusks mollusks are most mollusks have a shell sea slugs uh, don't most mollusks have a shell uh, the chitons are the only group of segmented mollusks they're kind of a link between mollusks and annelids I see those guys crawling on the rocks in the Florida Keys I've caught a few in Tampa Bay as well uh, but the Florida Keys they're very abundant people eat them uh, bivalves two-part shell that was me uh, pretending I had a shell uh, the scallop here, the scallop, uh, is an environmental indicator of water quality. So here in the Tampa Bay region, we used to have thriving scallops. And then in the 70s, uh, this place got, became real popular. People moved in and uh, wastewater was a problem and it basically wiped the scallop population out. Now the scallop population is making a recovery, indicating our water quality is rising. But bivalves have the two-part shell. Gastropods literally means stomach foot. Snails, gastropods. Slugs, gastropods. Cephalopod literally means head foot. Octopus, squid, the nautilus are all living gastropods. There was a time in Earth's history when gastropods ruled the seas that time is long gone they did not escape the great dying most gastropods uh, disappeared during the uh, extinction at the end of the Paleozoic the largest marine invertebrate the giant squid very elusive Arctuchus the Kraken uh, these are the first photographs taken of the kraken a living kraken because they live deep uh, and that was in 2004 but these guys have lived in legend for centuries arthropods jointed appendages jointed appendages two main groups the limulus pictured here uh, and then the crustaceans so these are not true crabs uh, but the horseshoe crab is a limulus. Uh, it's a different different group. Echinoderms mean spiny skin. They uh, pump water through their body in a water vascular system, and seawater is their blood. Uh, you have the what the laity call starfish, and that drives uh, a lot of marine biology is crazy. I know I went to. It, um the florida aquarium virtual field trip and i was filming and i said oh look starfish because i figured i was talking to you guys a basic audience and people call them starfish it's a common name and the young lady who was operating the touch tank admonished me saying they're not fish they're not fish i just pretended oh thank you so much for teaching me tried not to be um standoffish and i'm thinking Huh. No wonder people don't like scientists. Uh, seriously, we know they're not fish. People, love the oceanographer, marine biologists like to call them sea stars. But most people call them starfish. Anything you call them, they're echinoderms, spiny skin. You have brittle stars, crinoids or sea feathers, urchins, sand dollars are flattened sea urchins. They all belong to the Echinoderm phylum. Chordates can be invertebrate, like what we're looking here. They do have a nerve cord. Amphioxus, the one on the left. And then you have sea pork and sea cells, both, in, both belonging to a group called tunicates.
Now, larval tunicates resemble fish very closely, but um, adult tunicates are filter feeders. Then you have your classes of marine vertebrates. Agnatha are the jawless fish. Very simple. Lampreys, slime eels, uh, which we call hagfish. Chondrichthys are the cartilaginous fish. Sharks, skates, and rays. Osteichthys are the bony fish. Then you have amphibians. That means dual life. And they live in water and land. They're transition species. Not really uh, living in salinity, though. Reptiles. There's four types of marine reptiles. The salty or saltwater crocodile. The sea snakes and crates. The marine iguanas and the sea turtles. Then you have aves. Aviator comes from the term aves. Those are the birds. And then mammals, cetacea, sirena, carnivora. So there's a, a jawless fish. That's the lamprey. These guys are parasitic, ec ectoparasites. Ecto meaning outside. They attach and drain body fluids. Chondrichthys are the cartilaginous fish, most abundant fossil. A vertebrate fossil going our shark teeth. And here's some of the sharks, skates, and rays. Skates and rays have different reproductive processes, but they look the same. Osteichthys are bony fished, have a swim bladder for buoyancy, and they are the most abundant of the vertebrate groups. Reptiles their claim to fame is the uh, amniotic egg that allowed them to reproduce on land. Marine birds can live fully, you know, live oceanic lives or live out to sea. Uh, a lot of shorebirds hunt in the ocean, nest on land. So you have various lifestyles. The marine penguin, they flap their wings and fly underwater and they're amazingly fast. They're a little too portly to fly in the air, though. Our marine mammals, the cetaceas, the dolphins, porpoises, and whales, the carnivores, seals, sea lions, walruses, sea otters, and even the polar bear. And then sirena, the sirens of the sea, the Iliad, uh, and the Odyssey, these epic tales of sirens, these mystical ladies, uh, goddesses, mean, they would lure sailors to their death with beauty and song. And then the sirena, the manatees and the dugongs, uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That's all I got to say. Those are the groups of marine creatures. We're going to have a look now at ecology, the uh, science of marine life. Chemosynthesis and photosynthesis are the two producers for productivity, making food from chemicals and light. Chemosynthesis and photosynthesis. Uh, the chemosynthetic food chain, uh, sulfur, sulfide um, from the deep sea vents, Bacteria living in those deep sea tube worms, ripta, or uh, the clams, or free living bacteria metabolizes that into carbohydrates, food chain. Photosynthesis, you have plants and algae in the ocean, mostly algae, but this, this uh, graphic here calls it plant. Think algae though. Uh, you use the light's energy to split carbon dioxide and reassemble it into those carbohydrates, food chain. So chemosynthesis, the formula is carbon dioxide and oxygen and hydrogen sulfide produce water, sulfur, which smells bad. That's that stink, that low tide. Uh, and then glucose is one of the carbohydrates produced, used to power the food chain. Photosynthesis uses the carbon dioxide and water to 
split, reassemble into glucose. Oxygen is the waste. Respiration is the opposite of this, aerobic respiration. You use oxygen to split the glucose up, release its energy, and carbon dioxide's the waste. So that would be called aerobic respiration, and that's how living things harvest energy. Energy moves through the food chain. Producers get it from non-biological sources, chemicals, or the sun. 10% of that energy is passed on to consumers. So really, the rest is lost. And then consumers, 10% moves from primary consumer to secondary. You lose about 90% of energy with each step in a food chain or food web. Uh, the primary productivity can be measured in the ocean. And... Uh, It's about 120 grams of carbon into glucose a year per square meter. This chart, I like, I like this chart. It shows you where the oceans are most productive. And you can see right there in the north, North Pole area, most productive. Down in the South Pole area, pretty productive. Along those equatorial currents coming off of continents due to the trade winds, due to erosion, productive. And then the open oceans, very low productivity. The reason is sunlight can reach the bottom. Nutrients are abundant in shallower, close to shore environments. And cold water holds nutrients and oxygen the best. So a bunch of factors go into where the oceans are most productive. The primary producers, the most common, here's some cyanobacteria right here that's common called anabena, but that's photosynthetic bacteria. They're very important primary producers. The original primary producers on this planet, if you will. Uh, algae, like the diatoms or the macroalgae, primary producers. And plants, salt marshes, seagrass, mangroves. Ocean food chains are this example, the sun's providing the energy, the phytoplankton are converting that into carbohydrates, and then zooplankton eat them, smaller fish eat zooplankton, larger fish eat the small fish, and tuna sharks. Only 10% of that energy is passed from one level to the next. So when you eat a tuna sandwich, you're eating millions of phytoplankton or the energy equivalent. Food webs are just complex relationships in an ecosystem. 10%, we, we, we talked about the energy transfer. So a quarter pound of tuna is equal to 10,000 kilograms of primary productivity. So uh, a lot of environmentalists say eat lower on the food chain. And what they mean is don't eat the top predators, eat plants or herbivores. And that is more efficient when it comes to taxing the environment. There are several nutrient cycles present in the ocean, the carbon, nitrogen, Phosphorus, silicon, iron, and trace metal, nutrient cycles. We talked about the euphotic, dysphotic, and aphotic zone. An abiotic factor is a non living factor. When you look at an ecosystem, you look at the living things, the food chains, the relationships between the organisms, but you have to look at the non-living things, the light availability. Are there dissolved gases for respiration or photosynthesis? Temperature, acid base, those are the non-living factors. A limiting factor is the
the one thing that keeps the population in check. And if you remove it, that population will grow. So a limiting factor is what limits the population growth in a particular ecosystem. Some of the biological factors, feeding relationships, crowding, wastes, territorial defense, competition for mating, these are all biotic or living factors in ecosystems. Symbiosis are organisms that live together, the predator-prey, commensal, mutualistic, and parasite. Predator-prey, the first one. You know, it harms the prey individual, helps the prey species by weeding out the old and the sick, reducing competition. And uh, you can look at the population charts. You can see when prey is abundant, predators are, are a little less. Then they start to grow because of abundant prey, reducing the prey species. So they have an asynchronous boom and bust growth that move together. You remove the predators, though, the prey... That's a limiting factor on the prey. A lot of times the prey find the next limiting factor, which may be food, and they'll eat all the food and starve. So predators and prey have a balance that are linked. A lot of texts call it a positive-negative relationship. I call it a positive-positive relationship because they help each other and one cannot exist without the other. Commensalism is one organism, positive, benefits the other organism, neutral. So that example with the uh, scallop having a barnacle grow on it, I don't think the scallop cares. That's external skeleton. A barnacle has a place to live. The scallop is none the wiser. Mutualism are both organisms benefit. Parasite, you can see these sea lice, which are type of copepod, which are type of arthropod. Uh, they're draining the body fluid. That's an ectoparasite. They are negatively impacting the host. Thermal regulation, dealing with temperature changes. Some, and we call them cold-blooded in, in, in just a non-scientific circle, which is not true because, you know, on a 100-degree day, a cold-blooded organism has 100-degree blood. It's more uh, conformer. They, their body temperature changes. The regulators require a lot of energy to keep a consistent body temperature. Like humans, we have consistent body temperatures, birds and mammals. Uh, this is a image that was given to me by a fisherman. He caught this in uh, the Gulf off of St. Pete Beach. And uh, it was tangled in his nets. They freed, it, it was dead. These sharks constantly have to swim. They swim with their mouth open. Water moves over their gills and that's how they breathe because they don't have muscles on their gills to pump. Some sharks do, like the nurse shark can sit still and pump its own water, breathe, same way we pump air over our lungs. Others can't, they gotta constantly move for that water flow. That constant movement raises the body temperature and these sharks utilize it by having a pseudo warmer blood than the environment. So if it's 30 degree water, they would have 40 degree body temperature, gives them a, um, a uh, predatory advantage. Osmoregulation, we talked about uh, the movement of ions or water, and osmo, it's water. Uh, some organisms have uh, ionic pumps, so they concentrate their urine, things like that. Salt regulation balance, and, and we discussed that in an earlier module. Uh, salmon, now we'll, we'll do an example, and, and salmon, Freshwater is, uh, salmon in freshwater, they have very dilute urine. And uh, in salt water, they uh, have very concentrated urine. They drink a lot in salt water, drink like a fish, 
and then they concentrate the urine and get rid of salt. In fresh water, they don't drink at all. So I guess if you drink like a freshwater fish, you're alcohol free. Uh, they don't drink and, and they, 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 that's one of the uh, behavioral adaptions for osmoregulation. All organisms, animals, I should say, all animals need to get food. So they can filter feed, like the sponge. They can deposit feed, like in fauna, eating through the ocean floor, pulling out feces or other uh, nutrients. They can fluid feed, like the parasites. They can bulk feed, like the whales, the whale sharks, and the, the, the whales um, straining the water. Phagocytosis is uh, how cells uh, engulf. So those are all different modes of feeding. A lot of organisms migrate, migrate like the salmon. Some organisms migrate vertically with light and we call that phototaxis. Zooplankton at night rise to the surface and feed and during the day they drop to the 200 meter level to kind of hide in the shadows to avoid getting eaten. That's phototaxis, a round trip due to light. Uh, and anadromous fish, born in freshwater, swims to the ocean to grow, back to freshwater to reproduce. A catadromous fish, the opposite. Born in salt water, lives in freshwater, back to salt water to reproduce. Sea turtles migrate back to their natal beaches to reproduce. Gray whales, they live in the Arctic. They migrate once they're pregnant to their birthing areas uh, down in Baja, warmer water, less predation and then migrate back up once they've weaned their baby whale, their calf. Uh, and you know their migrations are down to a science, if you will, where people know where they're gonna be when, and hotels, and you can see in this in 2008, hotels are being sold various days at a premium so you can watch whales from your bedroom. Uh, Phototaxis, we mentioned, these zooplankton's rise and fall according to the water column. Succession is the change of an ecosystem over time. Primary succession is barren ecosystem, like a new volcano. But that's a rare compared to secondary succession, which is the recovery of a damaged ecosystem. Eventually, you get to a climax community when succession balances out and you have a mature ecosystem. Uh, some of the mature ecosystems, the rocky intertidal zone, are seaweed communities like the kelp forests, sandy beaches, salt marshes and estuaries, coral reefs, the open ocean, that pelagic zone, the deep sea floor, and hydrothermal vent and cold seep communities are all examples of mature ecosystems we find in the ocean. Well, folks, it looks like our time is up for module five, the biology of marine life. If you find this interesting, we do offer OCB 1000C here at St. Petersburg College. Uh, it is a field marine biology course where we go in depth in these topics and then we go out and visit our local climax communities and observe firsthand the organisms, the food chains, the abiotic factors, and kind of put it all together. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you have a great day and look forward to our next lesson.